this is a special edition of Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the premier financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Now, for this special edition of Macro Voices, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. Macro Voices All-Stars Episode 69 was recorded on October 7th, 2019. I'm Eric Townsend. Back with us today is GavCal co-founder Louis Vincent Gav. Louis, we were talking a little bit off the air. You know, it feels like to me, and I think you've probably got the same sense, it's time for something to change here. It feels like we've kind of been in this range-bound world where it looked like markets were topping, but they don't seem to want to go up and they don't want to seem to want to go down for more than a year now. Are we getting to a point where we're going to see a break in one direction or the other? And which direction are we going to see it in? Thanks again for having me again. Great to be on the show. Look, as you and I have discussed in the past, you know, my my starting point is I always think that three prices kind of determine everything else. The U.S. dollar, U.S. 10-year yields, and energy. Now, starting with 10-year yields, we've been in this 15 to 3% uh, training range on yield since 2012. Today, we're at the low end of that trading range. Uh, one big question mark is that we're going to break through. Obviously, each time you get to that 1.5% bottom, you know the, the bearishness on the global economy, the bearishness on the global geopolitics or whatever else is, is pretty thick. That's how you justify the, the one and a half. So we're there today. Are we going to break through on the downside? You move to the U.S. dollar. You know, if you look at the DXY, we've basically been around 97 now for five years, give or take 5% on either side of 97. You know, we've been in this trading range on the dollar. Today, we're sort of at the upper range of that trading range. So, you know, if bond yields break the 1.5, Will the U.S. dollar shoot up? That seems unlikely unless, of course, the bond yields are collapsing because of massive problems somewhere else in the world. But I'd be more inclined to think that the U.S. is actually the place where you could have the problems is you now have an impeachment against President Trump. You have a real threat of a, a Warren candidacy that uh, you know shouldn't be very bullish dollars or perhaps not even bullish treasuries. Then you look at oil, and oil is the interesting one because you've had massive news on oil recently, and yet oil is basically right on its average uh, of the past five years. It's uh, you know it's right on that fifty-five dollar mark, uh, you know, give or take a couple bucks. And really, for the past five six years, we've been you know between forty bucks and and seventy bucks, and sort of stuck at fifty-five. So you know, for me, those are the three important prices. And from there, you're right. You know, you look at global equities. You look at the world MSCI, you've had basically today the world MSCI is trading at the same level it was uh, in January 2018. So it's almost two years with no move on the world MSCI. Now, you could say, well, the world MSCI is the wrong one to look at uh, because actually if you break down U.S. and non-U.S., U.S. has been doing fine. U.S. equities is something that you and I have discussed in the past, and non-U.S. equities are basically massively underperforming. And that's been the one trend, I think, in, in recent years, the one massive trend, because you've had no real trend on bonds, no real trend on energy, no real trend on currencies. The one real trend uh, out there was the massive outperformance of U.S. equities. The big question is, is this coming to an end? In recent weeks, the U.S. has stopped massively outperforming. And is this coming to an end either because you know, the valuation gaps have just grown too big? Or is this coming to an end because the news out of the U.S. itself is frankly not that encouraging? You know, and it's hard to see how an Elizabeth Warren presidency would be that bullish for, for most U.S. assets. And it's hard to see how an impeachment of, of President Trump wouldn't create massive economic uncertainties. So, you know, in, in this environment, you know, what's what's the next big trend? What's the trend that we can really you know, bang our fist on the table about. Right now, you just seem stuck in these range trading zones on everything. The one massive trend that was there, the outperformance uh, of the U.S., seems to me to be running out of steam. Well, you know, it seems to me, Louis, like it's been running out of steam, and it's been pretty clear that it's been running out of steam for at least a year now, probably more like a couple of years. Yet at every turn, it seems like no matter what goes wrong, you know, the Speaker of the House announcing in Congress that they're launching an inquiry to impeach the President of the United States. Stock market takes a nosedive, lasts for all of 
48 hours maybe. And uh, as we're speaking on Monday, a few a few days before this episode will air, uh, we haven't quite recovered all the way to all-time highs. But, you know, most of this latest dip seems to have retraced. And it seems like uh, the stock market just catches this relentless bid almost no matter what happens. Is this because the market's expecting, you know, the so-called Greenspan put that we're, we're going to see accommodative monetary policy response if anything goes wrong? Is that what's going on here? And if we do get QE4, as some people are expecting, I'd love to get your opinion on that too, as to whether the predictions that some people have made that QE4 is coming in Q4 of this year, you know, does that mean that we go crazy higher on the stock market as we've seen with past QE episodes? Or is it maybe at the point where monetary policy is taking us as far as it can take us? Look, I think this is, this is of course, the question everybody's grappling with. First, are we going to get QE4? So, you know, one possibility is we're already getting it. I mean, the Fed was shrinking its balance sheet. The Fed is now done shrinking its balance sheet. It's expanding it again, partly to come in aid to the frozen repo market. So, you know, if you just look at the Fed balance sheet, it is no longer shrinking. It's back to expanding. So, you know, whether we call this QE or not, whether we call the $75 billion that the Fed's been injecting to save the the repo market, whether we call that QE, uh, who knows, but it's definitely liquidity injections. And so they are they are back to, to pushing money into the system. And yes, you know, if you look at, to your point, previous episodes of when the Fed was pushing money into the system, what did you see? You actually saw bond yields go up, not down. You know, QE, in the periods pre-QE, bond yields fell. In the period after QE was announced and implemented, bond yields tended to rise. So if we are about to see a QE, that would probably mean that once again, we'll bounce off the sort of 150 floor on the U.S. 10-year that we've bounced off many times before. Number one, will it lead to U.S. Uh, equity outperformance against bonds, uh, I would imagine, but against other uh, markets, I'm, I'm less sure. I think, you know, once it becomes pretty clear that the Fed is embracing QE again, and by the way, I, I do think they will embrace QE. When you look at the path of U.S. Treasury issuance uh, over the coming quarters, it's hard to envisage that the private sector will be able to uh, to digest so much U.S. Treasuries. The Fed will have to come in and help. So, no, you know, once you go down that path, uh, it's a path that is fundamentally more bearish for the U.S. dollar. I think one of the things that's one of the big factors that has been holding back a lot of equity markets, not least of which, of course, emerging markets, has been the relative strength of the U.S. dollar. Now, this, you know, the U.S. dollar hasn't been massively strong, but it's been strong enough to be a headwind for, for a lot of markets. Now, as the Fed goes back to embracing QE, you know, the, any, any fear of a massive U.S. dollar shortage, any fear of a U.S. dollar going through the roof dissipates, and that's, you know, that's broadly bullish. I think, for equities outside of the U.S. It's not bad for equities inside the U.S., but it's much more positive for equities outside of the U.S. Louis, the last time that we had you on, we talked about gold, and at that time, it was just shortly after this big breakout that we saw past 1350. You and I both thought that maybe it had gone a little bit too far too fast and that probably there would be another opportunity to buy gold below 1400 bucks. Um, yeah, I've got to tell you, gold has been blowing my mind with just how resilient it's been. Do you still think a pullback that deep is coming, or is this price starting to look like maybe it's the best we're going to see? Uh, no, I, I look, whenever I speak, I, I talk about gold, I often feel like taking a shower. You know, I, my, my starting point is as investors, we value assets on the cash flows they generate or, or will generate in the future. And so gold is, is a tough one, of course, to look at because it doesn't generate any cash flows. It's uh, you don't buy it, you know, because of its usefulness. You just buy it because it's it's rare, and you just bet that some some other sucker will buy it from you at a high price down the road. And having said all this, I uh, know look, I've I've liked gold for a while, even though, you know, I I have all my caveats as I just mentioned. My take on gold is pretty simple, and that is that for the past two or three decades, you've had two massive sellers of gold in the system. The gold mines, of course, that's a business. They dig it out of the ground and sell it. And central banks. Central banks had a massive amount of stock. And you know, year in, year out, central banks were net sellers of gold into the marketplace. And so with these two large sellers of gold, you had a fair amount of overhang on the price. 
Fast forward to today, and central banks are no longer net sellers of gold. Central banks are now net buyers of gold. You have central banks in Europe, Hungary, Poland. You have central banks in Asia. You have Russia. You have wherever you care to look, central banks are now more likely to buy gold than to sell it. Uh, and as an aggregate, they are now marginal buyers. So that leaves you with a market where there's only really one genuine seller of gold, and that's the gold miners. Now, the problem for the gold miners, of course, is, as anyone knows, invested in, in, in that space for the past decade, they've been repeat capital destroyers, and their share prices have been absolutely crushed in recent years. In fact, if you look at the overall gold miner index, it basically stands at the same level as it did in the late 1970s. They've been the biggest dogs in the market. As a result, you know, gold mines today are basically starved for capital. I know it sounds crazy in a 0% interest rate world, but nobody's had any interest in providing gold mines with capital. And so, you know, you look at, you know, the, the production coming on stream in the next few years, and it's likely to be very, very modest unless you get some, some freak massive find. In fact, what you're seeing amongst the gold miners is what you typically see at the bottom of, of commodity bear markets. Uh, they're taking, instead of going out and you know finding new fields, new mines, they're taking each other over. And so you see industry consolidation, which is, if you remember energy at the turn of the century, that's what we saw with Exxon taking over Mobil, BP Amoco, uh, you know, ConocoPhillips, and, and so forth. And so, you know, that's usually a, a pretty positive sign for the, for the underlying commodity. So, you know, I look at gold today. What do I see? I see consolidation uh, amongst the miners. I see fairly lim- limited amount of capital spending and mine expansion. I see central banks that have turned from sellers to buyers. And I wonder, you know, as you project yourself in two, three, four, five years, who will be selling gold uh, in the market and at what price? So, it's, yeah, I, I think you buy you, you buy gold on dips for sure. Louis, no interview with you would be complete without touching on Hong Kong. Holy cow, situation has escalated more quickly than I expected. And I'm actually quite surprised. You know, as, as you know, Hong Kong is an incredibly civilized place. And uh, we've seen some pretty significant violence. And uh, I just wonder what's next. What do you see on the horizon? What's driving this? Where is it headed? So first, look, the Hong Kong situation, obviously, it's, it's home for us, uh, for both you and I, but it doesn't hit home nearly as much as it does for, for all the Hong Kong people. Here, I just want to make a, a simple point, is that, you know, as, you know, as Americans get ready to celebrate Thanksgiving, et cetera, people always worry, are worried about discussions uh, at the table around President Trump or whatever. And however you divisive you feel President Trump is, however divisive you, you feel Brexit has been, for British society. It's nothing compared to the blue versus yellow debates that uh, are going around the tables and uh, uh, everywhere around Hong Kong. I hear constantly of, you know, lifelong friends that have fallen out uh, with each other. I hear constantly of brothers that won't speak to each other anymore because of how divisive uh, all these issues have been. Because fundamentally what you have in Hong Kong is two very separate visions uh, of society. On the one hand is the attachment to individual liberties, and that's really, I think, the the heritage left by the common law, left by Great Britain. The idea that, you know, what's what's most sacred in a society is individual liberty and that what we need is for the government to actually protect these, these individual liberties. And that's one vision of society. And another vision of society, the one that really prevails in China today, is the vision of the common good. That what everybody should strive for is, you know, fighting for for the common good, and that's really, you know, the the challenge in Hong Kong today. You have a vision of individual liberties versus a vision of of the common good. Uh, my hope was that, uh, and this is, of course, you could say that's been the conflict of political science and the conflict at, at the heart of every society, you know, for the past two hundred years. My hope was that uh, President Xi actually had a good opportunity to sort of kick that one into the long grass by postponing any debate uh, on his October 1st address to the nation. You know, if President Xi had come out and said, look, Hong Kong's been a terrific success, we're very happy with it, and so we'll extend the one country, two systems by 20 years to 2067, he would have cut the grass from uh, under the protesters' feet, and he would have also, you know, given all people thinking of investing in Hong Kong a a lot of comfort 
that this, the current system would prevail. And yes, you know, deal with uh, any consequential issues much further down the road. Unfortunately, you didn't do that. Uh, and so you're now stuck in this situation where you have a few thousand hardcore protesters, mostly college and even high school students, who, you know, really see themselves as willing martyrs for the cause of individual liberties against uh, a government machine that is really about implementing the the greater good. Now, what we can really regret, to your point, is Hong Kong was always a very nonviolent place. And and to some extent, you know, we've now had four months of demonstrations and there have been no deaths. There has been some police brutality, but by and, by and large, the police has been really restrained in their handling of a very, very tough situation. And so, you know, amidst all this, you know, it does feel as if this past weekend, you had a sharp deterioration in, in the violence, you know, really wanton property destructions, fires, etc. And it, it really seems that some of the protesters, uh, a small minority of the protesters, want to bring this to a head. They really, they, they're almost, they want the Chinese army to intervene so that they can have the fight that they've been thriving for. Uh, of course, China doesn't want that fight, and that fight won't happen. And so Hong Kong remains stuck in this limbo, and it, it's hard to see, you know, uh, how this ends. It I think it's you for the Hong Kong government and the, the Chinese government will just keep dragging this on until, you know, hopefully the demonstrators get tired of it. Louis, you mentioned that we have not seen China extend the 2047 deadline for one country, two systems to 2067. Do you think that they have effectively announced that they're not going to honor 2047 as some people are interpreting it? Or do you think that China is actually committed to keeping that commitment? Look, I think China is committed to keeping the 2047 deadline. You know, if in fairness, if they didn't want to do that, they didn't need to sign this in the first place. You know, as Deng Xiaoping sat down with Margaret Thatcher to negotiate the treaty back, you know, he held all the cards. He could have easily said, look, we'll just take over Hong Kong and we'll take it over now. Some simple facts, Hong Kong gets all, almost all of its water from the mainland. So, you know, the mainland could have just shut down the water and Hong Kong would have been fallen from the British for like in 48 hours, you know, Britain didn't really have, you know, an army to fight post-World War II if China had wanted to take over Hong Kong. So I think, you know, if you're Xi Jinping, you wake up in the morning and you got a whole pile of, uh, of problems to solve. Hong Kong was never at the top of the pile. I think the, the view was, well, if Hong Kong manages itself, that's good enough. And then, you know, that's, if, if it works, kind of, well, why fix it? Obviously, it, it doesn't work now, and there is a view that there have been failures uh, amongst the, the Hong Kong leadership, and that's probably because you know the, the setup that was agreed to with the Brits, which was basically we freeze the status quo for the next 50 years, is a very subpar setup. You know, freezing your institutions so that they absolutely do not evolve for 50 years is subpar. But at the same time, indeed, whenever you try to you try to change anything. You know, you get thrown the, the the notion that you're you're breaking your agreements. The bottom line is, the solution will have to come from within Hong Kong. The problem we have today in Hong Kong is a cruel lack of any kind of uh, political leadership. And still, you know, four months into this crisis, no political leadership emerging whatsoever. It's very disappointing. The the elites in Hong Kong have clearly, clearly failed the Hong Kong population. Well, Louis, I can't thank you enough for another fantastic interview. We look forward to getting you back in a few weeks for another update. For the Macro Voices Podcast Network, I'm Eric Townsend. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Please register your free account at macrovoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free research library. 
And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices.